fight. As I was working on this almost two weeks ago, things have unfolded over the last week that uh, certainly dovetail right into this. God is good. Ecclesiastes gives a list of the polarities regarding human activities. This wonderfully and powerfully constructed poem arranges human activities into pairs of constructive and destructive behavior, which in their totality construct the circle of life that we live in. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1, and then verse 8, it says, For everything is a season, a right time for every intention under heaven. In verse 8, it says, A time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, milchama, which means battle, war, engagement, to fight, and a time for peace, for shalom. There's a season, a time for every event, either constructive or destructive in our lives. Time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, a time for peace. Everything has its proper time and season for every intention, for every purpose under heaven, which means here on this earth. Adonai has established boundaries within our daily lives, within our emotions, certain times when it's appropriate to cry, when it's appropriate to laugh. I like those times. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to mourn and to dance, a time to tear down, and a time that's right to build, a time for war, to fight, and a time for shalom, for peace. The absence of conflict. What God is telling us is not to plant when it's harvest time and not to decree peace when it's a time of war, when it's time to fight. As we study and consume God's word, there are critical aspects that shout out to us through the fabric of time. Speaking to us today is our past and our history. As a people, we had become enslaved in Egypt by a pharaoh, a king, a governmental regime that received or viewed us in an unfavorable, even a negative manner, if you will, anti-Semitism. Adonai Shema, he heard our prayers and our cries. He witnessed our suffering under the yoke and the bondage and the oppression of Egyptian slavery. He supernaturally intervened on our behalf. Adonai raised up a leader, a redeemer, Moshe, who demonstrated God's power upon the earth before Pharaoh, his government, and the world, revealing that he alone is God and we are his people. He did so through 11 supernatural signs and wonders that we guard, that we celebrate, that we keep, that we remember every Pesach, every Passover. In fact, God commands us to do so, so that we will not forget who he is and what he has done for us and what he will do for us. As we continued in the Exodus heading towards Mount Sinai to meet and hear Shema from Adonai, we encounter violence. We encounter a force, a nation that seeks to destroy us. The Amalekites attack the fledgling nations of Israel. And if you will, Hamas today is the spiritual Amalekites. In Exodus 17, verse 8, then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. This situation isn't our first encounter with a violent army from a violent and aggressive government. When Egypt released us from slavery after the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn, we became entrapped between the Sea of Suf, the Red Sea, in front of us and a very angry Pharaoh behind us with the world's most technologically advanced army screaming toward us in armed chariots. In this situation, we didn't fight. We couldn't flee, so we panicked. Adam and I told Moshe to use his staff and part the sea, this is the 11th miracle, by which we crossed on dry ground to the other side. And what about old Pharaoh's army? Well, in Exodus 14, starting at verse 22, then the people of Israel went into the sea on the dry ground with the water walled up for them on their right and on their left side. The Egyptians continued their pursuit going after them into the sea, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and cavalry. And just before dawn, Adam and I looked out, to overlook, to down, look down or out, to gaze or to appear on the Egyptian army through the column of fire and the cloud and threw them into a pit. So the Panim, the face of God, appears in this column. But it doesn't appear to Israel. It appears to the army of Egypt. And it throws them into a panic. Verse 25, he caused the wheels of the chariots to break off so that they could move only with difficulty. The Egyptians says, Adonai is fighting for Israel against the Egyptians. Let's get away from them. Adonai said to Moshe, reach your hand out over the sea and the water will return and cover the Egyptians with their chariots and cavalry. The sea, verse 27, Moshe reached out his hand over the sea and by dawn the sea had returned to its former depth. The Egyptians tried to flee, but Adonai swept them into the sea. The water came back and covered all the chariots and cavalry of Pharaoh's army who had followed them into the sea. 
Not even one of them was left. Not one. First, when the visage or face of God appears throughout biblical history, we hear these words repeatedly, woe is me. Death is imminent. Egyptians, Egypt's army is thrown into a panic when they see the face or gaze upon this image of God from the pillar. And second, God himself is breaking these chariot wheels or axles so that the army gets bogged down and cannot pursue Israel. And lastly, God commands Moshe to reach his hand out over the sea, allowing the water to return and completely destroy both the chariots and the cavalry. Not one escaped. See, God can do anything. No, no army of this world can destroy them. So why doesn't God then destroy Amalek when they attacked Israel? In Ex Exodus 17, verse 9, Moshe said to Yehoshua, Choose men for us, go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with God's staff in my hand. Yehoshua did as Moshe had told him and fought with Amalek. Then Moshe, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And when Moshe raised his, up, raised his hand, Israel prevailed. But when he let it down, Amalek prevailed. However, Moshe's hands grew tired. He grew heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur held up his hands, the one on one side and the other on the other, so that his hands stayed steady until sunset. Thus Jehoshua defeated Amalek, putting their people to the sword. Adonai said to Moshe, write this in a book to be remembered and tell it to Jehoshua. I will completely blot out any memory of Amalek from under heaven. This is the first time, the first place in Torah that Israel is commanded to write something down in a document or a scroll. It was to be recorded for all future generations to memorialize. This was commanded before the giving of the Torah in Mount Sinai, which is a few chapters later. God was with us in this battle, but he didn't fight the fight this time. He commanded us to go out and fight. That day we put Amalek to the sword and we won the battle. From this battle on, we had to fight for every inch of soil in the promised land. We had to fight future attacks from the Philistines, the Amalekites, the Midianites, the Moabites, the Hagarites, the Ammonites, to name a few, as well as the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Greek Syrians, the Romans, then the contemporary nations of Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, and a made-up group known as the PLO, Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthi rebels in Yemen. With a few exceptions, almost every battle since this first one in Exodus 17, though God is with us, we must pick up the knife, the bow, the sword, the rifle, the glock, and we must fight. Amen. And why? Well, I want to share what I believe will be some surprising answers. First of all, ownership. Fighting prevents a welfare state. After having every need provided for by Egypt for some 200 plus years, we had become uncomfortable in our slavery. It didn't want to leave the system when Moshe was sent. It's like our entitlement generation today. Until that generation dies, you hear this repeatedly in the desert. Oh, if we'd only stayed in Egypt, where we had leeks, where we had melons, where we had fish. Only if we'd have stayed where we had fresh water. You brought us out here to die, Moshe. That entitlement generation now, when they obtain freedom, you have to fight for freedom. Amen. Freedom is not free. And all of a sudden, they don't like freedom now. They pine for the days of slavery in Egypt. Adonai delivered us through the profound demonstration of his power and the 10 supernatural plagues, yet look at our reaction when we're pinched between the Sea of Suf and the Egyptian army in Exodus 14, starting at verse 10. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up, saw the Egyptians right there coming after them. In great fear, the people of Israel cried out to Adonai. There's a common phrase in Scripture 365 times throughout the entire book of a phrase of, do not fear, fear not, be not afraid. One for every day of the week. In great fear, the people of Israel cried out to Adonai. They had just experienced these 10 signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. And yet now they're frightened. In verse 11, he said to Moshe, was it because there weren't enough graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to die in the desert? Why have you done this to us? Bring us out of Egypt. Didn't we tell you in Egypt to let us alone? We'll just go on being slaves for the Egyptians. It would be better for us to be the Egyptian slaves than to die in the desert. Out of the mouth speaks the heart. Why this posture of panic after living through the demonstration of God's power in the first 10 plagues? They were slaves physically and spiritually. They as of yet have no ownership in what God is doing. There's no reverence or fear of the Lord in their hearts. If everything is always given to you or handed to you, the appreciation and gratefulness rarely develops. 
James 1, starting at verse 6, But let him ask and trust, doubting nothing, for the doubter is like a wave in the sea, being tossed and driven by the wind. Indeed, that person should not think that he will receive anything from the Lord, because he is double-minded, unstable in all his ways. See, the doubter, the unbeliever, receives nothing. You appreciate and respect what you must work and fight for, what you must pray and fast for. You'll be a good steward, and then you'll take care of it. <laughs> I haven't shared this one a long time. I bought my first vehicle when I was 15. A 1967 GMC C20, 283 V8 short block. It, it, it would climb a wall, but it wouldn't go over 55 miles an hour. I pay for that with my own money. I drove it around for a year on the farm, got my driver's license. Four months into my driver's license, I drove that thing like I stole it. Blew the head right off of it. Seized the engine. Guess who walked for the next seven months? Yours truly, to had enough money to buy a new engine and replace that engine. You learn a hard lesson. You destroy and beat up what's not yours. But when you got to pay for it and you got to fix it all of a sudden, right? Remember when you finally moved out? Now who's telling everybody to shut the lights off? <laughs> Having to work or fight for it removes the spirit of entitlement. Scripture further clarifies in 2 Thessalonians 3, starting at verse 10, for even when we were with you, we gave you this command. If someone won't work, he shouldn't eat. We hear that some of you are leading a life of idleness, not busy working, just busy bodies. We command such people, and in union with the Lord Yeshua the Messiah, we urge them to settle down, get to work, and earn their own living. Warfare has another profound impact on people and societies. It develops and creates the atmosphere of unity, of echad, of completeness, of oneness. I've done dozens of messages about unity over the years. It's very clear that God desires unity, and Hasitan desires division. In James 1, verse 4, but let perseverance do its complete work so that you may be complete and whole, lacking in nothing. If there's no unity or completeness, there's no wholeness. Something is lacking. The manifestation of unity of this ikad, this binding together, is love for the Lord and love for each other. To persevere under misfortunes and trials means you've got to fight. Warfare in the spirit and warfare in the flesh. Through the sacrifice of Yeshua, God has made Jew and Gentile Echad, this one new man, one new humanity. But even more importantly, this unity, this echad, has given us complete access in one spirit to the Father. This is a necessity as we are under full-scale assault. The enemy is seeking our division and our demise at all costs. Now, I shared this in May, but I've got an update for you now. The UMC, the United Methodist Church, voted on May 3rd, 2024, to change its bylaws called the Book of Discipline, repealing its long-standing ban on same-sex marriages by its clergy or in its churches. That change allows clergy to be themselves homosexuals and to perform all homosexual ceremonies celebrating homosexual unions. The decision followed a repeal of a language banning homosexuality among the clergy two days earlier. For 52 years, they had labeled homosexuality as incompatible with Christian teachings. Then a week ago, this past Monday, July 1st, and this is at the exact same time, we're at the Maasai Conference having our BBM, our biannual business meeting, which, by the way, we heard a fantastic report. Almost $14 million have been sent through the Joseph Project to aid Israel since the war October 7th. Amen. Come on. Almost $4 million sent to Ukraine since the beginning of that war. And just seven months ago, we were able to slip in, and you were part of this. We got 16 generators across the border. I'm not going to tell you how. So those 27 congregations there can have power when they meet together. Can you imagine the bomb siren going off right now? We have 20 seconds to get to the bomb shelter and turn the generator off. We just don't understand how good we have it. At the same time as we're having our biannual business meeting, the Presbyterian Church is having its biannual business meeting. They have 8,800 churches, 1.14 million members, and they've voted to, divide, to divest from financial bonds in Israel and denounce Christian Zionism. They turned her back at Israel, the entire denomination. Now, the irony is the first Hebrew Christian church was founded by the Presbyterians in 1934, 90 years ago. The Hebrew Christian Alliance, which is the forerunner to the MJAA, began in 1915 in a Presbyterian church in Chicago. Yet here we are. Then this week, leaked text messages from Columbia University deans 
revealed a dismissive and sarcastic attitude towards the concerns of Jewish students and staff. They mocked the Hillel director who was setting an alarm against a quickly rising anti-Semitism on campus. His warning fell a deaf and mocking ears. Three Columbia staff members were let go this week. But I got a question. Why did it take six months? Why the dragging feet? Did, did all of a sudden now we find out anti-Semitism or racism is wrong? It doesn't take six months to figure this out. Now, this past week, the new administrations of both England and France have pledged to recognize Palestine statehood, even though both the PLO, Hamas, and Hezbollah openly state they do not seek statehood, only our destruction. This past 10 days, the Biden administration admitted delaying the delivery of up to 6,500 joint direct attack munitions, according to the Wall Street Journal, and has held up delivery of thousands of precision Jewish weapons to Israel when they need our support the most. And all Israel News reported last Shabbat, a week ago today, that a three-stage peace plan was being presented by U.S. President Joe Biden. The first stage would see the release of, listen to this, this is exact language, several hostages for hundreds of terrorists. They came out today and said both sides have tentatively agreed to this. Listen, how about all the hostages released right now are no talks, no negotiations, and no discussions until every hostage, dead or alive, is accounted for and in our hands? That's the only talk I want to hear. This following article was published June 9th in the Prophecy News Watch. It says, in the book of Jeremiah, we're reminded of the dangers of people pretending to speak for God when, in fact, they are spreading lies. Jeremiah 14, verse 14, Nader and I replied, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I didn't send them, order them, or speak to them. They are prophesying false visions to you, worthless divinations, the delusions of their own minds. One such recent example, this, I'm sorry, is Presbyterian pastor Rebecca Todd Peters, who preached that if Jesus were giving a sermon on the mount today, he might add, blessed are those who end pregnancies, for they will be known for their loving kindness. Peters is on a mission to shift the Christian paradigm that abortion is not only sinful, but a good and moral thing to do. She, of course, serves on the clergy advocacy board of the Planned Parenthood and often wears her Planned Parenthood stole when giving sermons. Now, I'm not giving you these examples to irritate you, but I pray you are irritated and indignant. But these examples, they're not a surge. It's a tidal wave attempting to sweep away all kingdom foundations. One of Hasatan's main tools is to minimize or negate the biblical role Israel represents in Scripture and prophecy. Hasatan's causing a great apostasy across our land, causing this global tide of anti-Semitism and great division. But here's what we got to remember. First of all, you're at war. Second of all, you got to get in the fight. A war could be going on, but you're not being involved in it. But this is all hands. God has called all hands on deck. We're at war. We must fight. And you got to remember that in Exodus 22, 25, Adonai directly intervened for his people. He caused those wheels of the chariots to break off and the axles to break so they could move with great difficulty. See, it doesn't matter if we send arms or not to Israel. God himself will intervene and start swatting missiles out of the sky and cause all the enemy tanks and mortars and RPGs to not work. Amen. See, God would rather have us involved in this and we receive the blessing. But if we don't, and if this nation turns us back on Israel, God will still grant them the victory. Amen. And ironically, the absolute first anti-Semitite wasn't Pharaoh, it wasn't Ben Hadid, it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar, Haman, Stalin, or Hitler. The first anti-Semite was an angel. A fallen angel whose name is Hasitan, who loathes everything of Adonai, who loathes his chosen people, and who loves to destroy our people. That's at the top of his list. This is why it never goes away. Anti-Semitism is not of this world and will exist until Yeshua returns and Hasitan gets locked up for a thousand years. This is what we, you, the Messianic movement, the Messianic community, the Messianic believers are who Hasitan absolutely detests and despise. In Revelation 12, starting at verse 15, the serpent spewed water like a river out of its mouth after the woman in order to sweep her away in the flood. But the land came to her rescue. It opened its mouth and swallowed up the river, which the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. The dragon was infuriated over the woman, who is Israel, and went off to fight. Polemos in the Greek, which is to 
conduct war, warfare, fight, battle, dispute, to quarrel the rest of her children who obey God's commands and bear witness to Yeshua. We all know that's us. Half the body of Messiah doesn't obey God's commands, and the Jewish side don't bear witness or testimony to Yeshua. There's only one narrow group of people, and that's us. So this reveals right here who the enemy hates. The dragon, Hasetan, he loathes you and what you stand for. And will do everything in his power to destroy you, to silence you, and get you to not do what you're doing. Jonathan Kahn spoke after I did last Saturday, and I'll give credit where it's due. He shared this at the Messiah Conference. The serpent, the dragon, Hasetan, spews a river like water out of his mouth to sweep her Israel away in this flood. The official name of Hamas's October 7, 2003 invasion of Israel is, guess what? Operation Al-Aqsa. You know what Al-Aqsa means in Aramaic? The flood. What did I just read from Revelation 12? Spewed water like a river, like its mouth, out of its mouth to what? Swallow up the woman, the river, the Israel. The official name of Hamas's October 7th invasion was Operation Al-Aqsa. All in Aramaic is... The, while Aksa in Arabic is the flood. That's nothing short of supernatural. It's not a coincidence that that demonic, horrific, brutal, barbaric, and indescribable slaughter of our people that occurred on October 7th was named the flood by Hamas, who I doubt retain any knowledge of Revelation chapter 12. I spoke just before Jonathan spoke last Saturday. We were chatting together in the green room, catching up. We've known Jonathan for over 20, we knew Jonathan Khan before he was Jonathan Khan. And after I spoke, I ended my message with Emma's Ryle Chai. And as I came back into the green room, he came up to me and he was so excited. He said, man, I can't believe how our message is parallel. He said, guess how I am? I'm ending my word. I give up. He said, I'm Israel Chai. And he excitedly shared that he was going to do just the same. He shared in his message the numerous issues of tax. He's got a new book coming out called The Return of the Dragon. And by the way, my message and his message, we have an audio file. If you want to copy this, Email Mark, we'll send it out next week. You'll get a copy of it through the email. But he shares during this, as he began writing this, his congregation in Wayne, New Jersey, suffered three floods. It made the place an island. You couldn't couldn't get to it. And as he was preparing his message that day, last Saturday, for the Messiah Conference, at the critical stage of his message, the most strategic place of what the information God wanted him to share, his computer died. And it said it took four texts from the college, nor on a college campus, so you, know, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting an IT tech. They're everywhere. Four of them took several hours to get that computer back up and retrieve his message off of that computer. Jonathan shared, he said, man, I, he says, I never get sick. All day Saturday, I had a raging migraine headache. And as he was at the end of his message, he, he's, he's shouting Amos Rao Kai. He's, he's, he's really getting it at the end. And you hear him kind of <clears throat> like choke, like something stuck in his throat. But the mic's still on and you can hear him say, you're not going to stop me. Amen. And, and he presses forth right to the end of the message. I thought, man, but you got to hear this. An hour and a half before I started my message, I got a sharp stabbing pain in my right kidney like someone's hacking me with a machete. Out of nowhere. Man, what in the world? But I go up anyways. And after I hear his message, I'm like, Wow. So I communicated with him and I shared with him Monday. I said, I wanted you to know, Jonathan, that one and a half hours before I spoke Saturday evening at the Messiah conference, I started to get a very sharp pain in my right side, lower abdomen towards my back. I had it while I spoke. Then as I listened to your message, it was getting worse. Rebiss and I, we were doing some things. We promised to pray with some people. As soon as we could get out of there, we get out of there. We go back to the hotel. We, I lay back. She's like, is it getting better? I'm like, no. She says, we got to go to the ER. And I'm like, yep. It's that bad that now I'm starting to dry heave. We went to the emergency room at Penn State Health, and it's called the Holy Spirit Hospital. (laughs) I'm coming from the Messiah Conference to the Holy Spirit Hospital. It was not too long of a wait as the hospitals go. You know, we got there about 11 o'clock, got out about 4 a.m. They did a CAT scan. Guess what? I had a four to five millimeter kidney stone stuck in my right exit duct. Hasatan tried to do to me the same thing he tried to do to Jonathan. He tried to silence us. 
And after I spoke Saturday evening, I had a I had an Israeli sobber come up to me in tears. And she's saying, this hasn't been heard anywhere. She's like, this needs to be heard in Israel. This needs to be heard around the world. No one's talking like this. So I knew something was going to happen. This is it probably I've shared in the office today. In 24 years, there's been about eight or nine times when you're at a Moedim and you know there's something different right now. And, and you know, ironically, I spoke about complacency a couple of weeks ago. We've been going to the Messiah Conference for over 20 years. So, it's Messiah Conference, la ti da. Going up Saturday, I knew there was something different. This was going to be a shift in the spirit realm. Something's going to happen. And it did. Jonathan shared back with me this week, and I'm going to read you what he shared. He sent this to me yesterday morning. He said, thanks for letting me know what happened. You and I were on the same spiritual page Yes, I heard you speak the words, Am Israel Chai, and I had written those same words in my message. He said, I knew it. It's not surprising what happened to you, but I'm sorry it did. At the same time, it's a great sign. You're doing the Lord's will, and the Lord is with you powerfully. We've always been on the same page. It was a blessing to minister with you. Please keep me in prayer. I'm in Charlotte. He actually did an interview with uh, Sid Roth for the new book. I'm about to do uh, my first interview for the new book, The Dragon's Prophecy, and I'm suddenly sick this morning and my computer totally died. I emailed him back, you are and will remain in our prayers, both you and your entire family. His words were an encouragement, but it brought the highlight that we're at war. Do things happen? Yes. But the timing? No. I'm sorry, that's warfare. Because that, that could have happened Sunday morning, it could have happened, you know, Yesterday, I'm in the hospital. I had that sucker removed. No more kidney stone. It had to go. You know, ironically, Hasetan wants to whisper in your ear, a storm's coming. But you know what you got to whisper back? I am the storm. You are the storm. And once we understand that, once you know who you are in Messiah, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. No word can come against you. No gossip, no slander. Not one, a fiery dart will come in one direction and flee in ten, ten different directions. The enemy wants to silence you. He wants you to keep you quiet. He wants you out of the game. But here's what we got to get back up in the game again and again and again and again and again. After as many books as Jonathan has written and where he's at strategically, you know he's number one. I love that back with the seven sons of Sceva, right? Peter we know, Yeshua we know, Shaul we know, but who are you? And they beat the tar out of him. As I shared last fall, Hamas is actually a biblical promise found in Isaiah 60, verse 18. It says violence, and that word in Hebrew is actually Hamas, will no longer be heard in your land, desolation or destruction within your borders. Instead, you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. See, the land came to her rescue. It swallowed up this river, this flood, which further infuriates the dragon. See, Hamas, and I'm not saying this is October 7th, is specifically that Revelation chapter 12, but they sought the entire annihilation. You know, they had plans to go to Jerusalem all the way to Tel Aviv. They had the plans, the ability, the provision, the ammo to do it, but the plans were thwarted because when they got out into the desert, the land what? Swallowed them up. It ended the attack. To put this in perspective, the dragon is Hasetan, the fallen angel, who masquerades as an angel of light, as Shaul shared in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14. This is why so many believers are falling prey to the lying spirits and demonic doctrines. In their immaturity and famine of the word, they're not able to discern the masquerade. All those examples I just shared with you from the Methodists and from the Presbyterians, you think, how in the world can they do that? Because they're not able to discern who's masquerading before them. They look at this angel of darkness and say, well, it looks like an angel of light. But what is being spoken of doesn't reconcile to the word. You've got a problem. Amen. Believers and pastors are falling in unprecedented numbers. Anti-Semitism, wokeism, the LGBTQT, cancel culture are experiencing quantum growth within the body, within the body of Messiah. We expect this in the world, not within the greater body. Children of God are unable to discern truth from untruth. They're unable to discern the wolf dress and the sheep's clothing. Their love has grown cold because of increased distance from Torah. They don't know the word, and they do not retain a biblical worldview. 
What the dragon absolutely hates, what he loathes, is Adonai, his people, and Israel for bringing the Messiah into the world who defeated HaSatan. Wherever you find anti-Semitism, you found the dragon. Let me say that again. Wherever you find anti-Semitism, I don't care where you find it. If you find anti-Semitism, you found the dragon. You found HaSatan. Demonic influence is why people are anti-Semitic. As Messianic believers, we are these children who obey God's commands and bear witness to Yeshua. Holy warriors who will fight, who will fight for the truth, who will fight for the kingdom of God, who will fight for justice, who will fight against lies and deceptions, who will fight against the temptations and scourges of HaSatan, carrying swords of God's word that cuts to the marrow and divides between pure and impure. We must understand that we're at war. The dragon is engaged in a full frontal assault while most of the body is asleep. See, we're in a post-exilic time frame, rebuilding the ancient foundation as in the days of Nehemiah, who did it the first time. And we must remember how Nehemiah did it. Nehemiah 4, starting at verse 11 or 17, depending upon what translation you have, says, as they continued building the wall, those who carried loads held their loads with one hand and carried a weapon in the other. Verse 23 or verse 17 says, I, my kinsmen, my servants, and my bodyguards never took off our clothes, and everyone who went to get water took his weapon. What? You may think that's a reach. How did I get from there to here? Because we're in that final post-exilic period. We're in the days of Nehemiah 2,000 years later, when the last and final days are being prepared for Yeshua's return. So we're in the building process. Remember Acts 3, Yeshua's return is hindered until the restoration of all things. How are all things going to be restored? That's you and I. We're going to do this. It's time for us to start rebuilding. But we're going to rebuild with a brick in one hand and a Glock in the other. That's how it's done then, and that's how it's going to be done now. But we must be a cod. We must be unified as a community that stands upon the truth of God's word and fight, as written in Proverbs 28, verse 4. Those who abandon Torah praise the wicked. But those who keep vishamre, to keep, guard, observe, give heed to, to treasure, to observe. And you know this root word, shamar, guard or protect. Those who keep, those who guard and protect Torah, fight them. See, so we get a mentality that we're just the idly stand by and let this stuff go on in our world. No, those who abandon Torah, they praise it. But our job is to fight those who abandon Torah. And that means spiritually, physically, financially. I've shared this so many times in the last 20 years. I'm stunned at the advance of the homosexual community, but I'll give them credit. Because they're homosexuals 24-7, seven days a week. Believers don't act that way. We have a Shabbat believer or a Sunday believer, then we have the Thursday believer, and they're not the same. And that's what the unbelieving world finds unbelieving. If we had the same persistence, the same echad, the same unity, the same loyalty, if we put our finances back behind this, we would have a complete revolution in our hands. Make no mistake, Yeshua is telling us to take a stand in this world, to fight for his kingdom, the, the fight of faith, which is a spiritual armament from Ephesians 6, but also physically to protect, to defend ourselves, and to become one. The enemy will not and cannot silence or stop us. I will not be silent. Amen. I will not be silent. We will speak and fight for the truth, to demand it, to seek the restoration and renewal of the greater body. 1 Timothy 6, verse 12, it says, Fight, agonizomahi, to fight, to contend, to struggle with difficulties and dangers. We're to fight the good fight. Ag one, conflict, fight, race, any struggle, a battle, an action, at law, a trial. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you testified so well to your faith before many witnesses. We clearly see that the fight and battle is both spiritual and physical. The enemy never relents from his attacks. Believers must learn to overcome fighters, and we can't be complacent. You can rest assured that after Saturday evening, I amped up my prayer life considerably. Why? Because I let her guard down. Because the Messiah Conference is a safe place. We do this every year. Uh, no, it's not. Something shifted this year. And ironically, the enemy knew it before most of the believers did. We must learn to become fighters, to be unprepared against Hasetan or to run from the fight is to ensure defeat. Shaul explains why we must be fighters. We must be fighters because we struggle against the evil forces of darkness. Remember the word of Adonai in Zechariah 4, 6. Not by force, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. But will he find warriors? 
or not. Let's rise. For those who've had a kidney stone, you know what I've been through this week. I, I had it removed yesterday. For those that have given childbirth, then you know. But I'm even more resolved and more determined now than I was a week ago. Because of that aha moment. Where is this really coming from? And he's a liar. He's the father of all lies, the chief adversary. But I got news for him. We're not going to lay down. We're going to continue to rebuild. We're going to continue to fight until we see the complete total release of this one new man for this eastern gate of America. That is America's destiny. It's in our DNA. It's who we are. Father, right now in Yeshua's name, I'm just releasing a spirit of a warrior into every person that is in hearing of my voice right now. Father, I'm praying for fresh revolve, resolve, for determination, for strength and tenacity, to not relent, to fight the good fight. Father, I'm praying for an increase in prayer and fasting. I'm praying for warring angels to encamp around us. Father, it's time for us to not trench in and go on the defensive, but it's time for us to go on the offensive because that's what you've called us to do. So, Father, help us to get out of these walls, get out of these chairs, and take your kingdom out there to the darkened and dying world and spread light upon the darkness. Embolden us, Father God. Prepare us. Strengthen us. Make us ready for the fight because it's battle stations for every one of your children. That's where we're at. So we honor, we glorify you, Father God. Lord, I'm praying for the increase of the gifts, for the weapons in every one of your children's hand, Father God. Let remembrance of Scripture come freely to their mind, Father God, to sow your word into every situation and into the atmosphere as we prepare a place for your son's return when we hear that shofar sound. And he comes, the glorious groom for the glorious bride. Make us one, Abba, Father, and give us the victory in you. Because your word says we are super conquerors in all things. We glorify it and we honor you this evening, Abba Father. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen and amen. If you would stay where you're at right now, let's seal this with this ancient blessing to put God's ineffable name upon you. Veishmerecha Ya er Adonai panevelecha Vichunecha Yisar Adonai panevelecha Vesem lecha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face toward you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his face toward you and give you peace. Shabbat shalom.